start, I think. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're very happy to host Professor Bruce Manning, also coming back straight from Russia. And the topic of his lecture today will be Emperor Nicholas II, Master and Commander. And uh, before Professor Norman Sell introduces Professor Manning, I just would like to mention uh, a few events that are happening in the next two weeks. This Thursday, October 10th, we have a visitor who's coming uh, to KU in conjunction with the Russian Review, Professor Michael Gorham from the University of Florida. And his talk uh, is titled, Trolling, Power of Political Communication in Putin's Russia. Um, in his talk, he will offer a brief conceptual history of the notion of trolling and explore its implications for politics, culture, and language in contemporary Russia. And so this is happening on Thursday, October 10th, 5.30 p.m. And the location is uh, a rare one for us. It's Burge Union Forum V. Um, so you're all welcome to attend. And just to give you a preview of what will be happening uh, further down the line um, on Monday, October 21st, we'll have a Pali slash Bacchus slash Chinchala Memorial Lecture. Uh, Professor Steven Siegel from the University of Northern Colorado uh, will come and deliver a lecture uh, titled Map Man Geographers Worlds and the Making of East Central Europe. And then on Tuesday, October 22nd, he will deliver a brown bag talk titled Lost, Lost Lands Toward an East European Gazetteer of Lines, Geobodies, Fantasias, and Hoaxes from Ruritania to Vaishnoria. I'm not <laughs> making it up. Uh, so this is what awaits us. And now without further ado, please introduce Professor right. Manning. Thank you, Justina. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce an old friend, <laughs> Bruce Minnie, um, who uh, has covered the waterfront, I think, of military history uh, and uh, has been mainly noted for bayonets for, bu for bullets. I recommend that book. It is very readable and it <laughs> shows how uh, the Russian army developed during the period before and after, before and during World War I. Um, he's been back to Russia many times, most recently last month, <laughs> and uh, doing research and other things, keeping in touch with what's going on there. And so you may want to explore that front as well. Anyway, he is here to talk about uh, Emperor Nicholas II as the commander of the Russian army in World War I. Thank you very much, Professor Saul. Um, it's hard, you know, using the old hackneyed expression, time flies, but uh, as uh, Professor Saul was introducing me, I was thinking, well, just coming back from Russia, and about a month ago, I was still in Yekaterinburg. And, of course, that's the uh, locale of the uh, murder of the entire Tsarist family in 1918. And um, as one of the byproducts of uh, doing some uh, presentations there at the uh, Oral Federal University, uh, I had a chance to uh, get to uh, the places of the uh, emperor's, of the murder of the emperor and his family, uh, their first burial and their second burial, recovery, and all of that. And uh, uh, it's a sad kind of pilgrimage to make. Uh, and uh, I thought I just had to do it just to see the places where they were. Of course, the actual house where, he sat, uh, where the murder was carried out, it was destroyed uh, when Yeltsin was first secretary of the uh, Oblast uh, Communist Party and then Sverdlovsk. Uh, so what they've done is they built a church over, uh, over that site and then down below there is a crypt that's all lit by red lanterns, which is built right over that room in the Epatier uh, house where uh, the, the imperial family was murdered. So it's very interesting in its own. 
Now, um, what I'm doing with uh, the Emperor as uh, Emperor Nicholas II as Master and Commander, and I, uh, I chose that title uh, really quite deliberately uh, uh, because as a result of my research on uh, the Imperial Russian Army during World War I, uh, it occurred to me that uh, in many ways Nicholas II answered to that, uh, the title of that well-known movie now uh, after Patrick O'Brien's novel, Master and Commander. Uh, the far side of the world, which would be, of course, your Katarinburg for us is the far side of the world, but because uh, in many ways, uh, both in reality and in irony, uh, Nicholas II was master and commander, and uh, we'll talk about that because uh, what we'll see later on in the slides is that when they did the 1897 census and asked him uh, what his occupation was, and his answer was master of the Russian land. Uh, and uh, you see him here, this is not uh, in color, uh, but uh, he's in the uniform of the Priobrzhinsky Guards Regiment. Uh, that was uh, the favorite, usually, well it wasn't his favorite, reg it wasn't his favorite regiment, his favorite was the Lifeguard Hussars. But uh, every uh, uh, ruler since the time of um, Catherine the Great in the 18th century, would periodically uh, wear the uniform of the Priobrzhinsky Regiment. It was the regiment that was most associated with the ruler. And Nicholas II had actually served as, as not as regimental commander, as battalion commander, first battalion at Tsar's own, in the Tsar's own uh, regiment, uh, the Priobrzhinsky. And you can't see his shoulder boards there. If you could, what you'd see on them would be A3 for Alexander III, his father. And uh, he never wore any rank higher than that of a guards colonel. Uh, so he fancied, he always wanted to be and fancied himself to be a regimental commander. So there you are, master and commander. Uh, and what you'll see on the slide is something that I've I've worked through, it occurred to me when I was trying to characterize the emperor's personality that uh, I kept thinking as I looked at his characteristics that uh, he reminded me of Isaiah Berlin's old description of Tolstoy, uh, the writer, you know, in which uh, he has that brilliant essay, you know, the, the Hedgehog and the Fox. And in his own kind of different way, in my view, uh, uh, Nicholas II uh, displayed some of the same characteristics, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a minute or two. But by background, you'll see Stalin adhered to autocratic power and so on, guards officer through and through, and uh, has all the, the uh, manner of an English gentleman. And now back to Isaiah Berlin. Oh, and by the way, uh, this has also been used with reference to uh, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, McGregor, James McGregor Burns' biography, I think, of Roosevelt is subtitled The Hedgehog and the Fox. Uh, and uh, what it amounts to is, is that, uh, and we'll come back to that in a, in a minute again, but uh, here is the family side of things. Uh, you have him as a, as a gentleman, a devoted family man, and in part uh, that's picked up from uh, uh, the closeness of, his, of, 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 of being brought up in the family of his father, Alexander III. And then down here, as you see him as a young guards officer, there he is in the officer's mess as a uh, guards colonel. And uh, you can't, well, yes, you can. You can see it well enough. I had to do a double take on this to figure out which was which. Or which was which. Uh, he, he looks that close, uh, cl that closely resembles King George V. Okay. Here we're coming back to Hedgehog and Fox. And what it was, and, and I've got this untracked, not the way I should probably, but uh, he's a hedgehog in the sense 
that what he is devoted to is retaining all of the attributes and all of the power of an autocratic monarch uh, in the mold of his father. Uh, he is completely dedicated to uh, tr uh, transferring that autocratic monarchy as it was to his son, holding it and then transferring it to his son. That's his big idea. And here you have the hedgehog. This is the, the one big idea. And it's probably not expressed any better than in that quotation from uh, his appearance uh, soon after his, his uh, coronation uh, before an assembly of notables of the empire. And yet, on the other hand, uh, the imperfect fox. And there you see it, the contradiction between you. You grab by that one idea, and yet when you look, you know, you look through his papers, you look through the various uh, accounts of uh, his day-to-day -day, uh, life and so on, you'll see that he's obsessed with detail, but he can't put all the detail together in a very meaningful way. Uh, not always, but at least in many instances. And my problem is, this is uh, a quote that I drew from uh, my colleague Dominic Levin's biography of Nicholas II, a very good biography. Uh, and uh, I, uh, he has it there, and he quotes several different sources, and um, probably in one of those discrepancies that inevitably occurs as one goes to press, and as one writes and rewrites, he got his notes mixed up. So I've got to go back to uh, Professor Levin and ask him, okay, I went to the archive to see, uh, I couldn't find it in the archive, I couldn't find it in Krasny Archive, but I need to go back because this is an incredibly important uh, uh, um, summation written by an incredibly important person. Probably most of it was his tutor uh, and was the primary ideologist of, the, of autocracy uh, in the last years of the empire. But there are other problems in addition to this. And most of you, if you know anything about Nicholas, you, 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 you know these. I, you notice I've, I've avoided saying indecisive. I think uh, Professor Steinberg and I might vary with that. I think John calls him indecisive. I don't. I just say he's unsure of his decisions. And uh, when you look through the memoirs of one of his, uh, one of the officers who served with him in the Preobrazhensky regiment, uh, uh, a man named Yepanchin, who later became uh, head of the Corps of Pages, he said, he said the problem was he was not exposed to enough varied experiences while he was growing up, and so he did not have uh, that sense of how to look at things. You know, from with varied perspectives, how to aggregate uh, disparate uh, materials and so on. He said it's just not in his background. <coughs> but at the same time, and this seems almost like a, a family characteristic, his brother, uh, Michael Alexandrovich, same thing. That, that sense of serenity, uh, you know, the world can be melting around you and you're not going to show it. It's that English gentleman, you know, uh, that uh, if your estate is falling down, okay, if you have a disagreement, you don't raise your voice, you settle it in private. Uh, uh, everything outwardly uh, looks good and looks, looks like it's in fine shape. And here's the key thing, the key problem with autocracy is that what might have been all well and good for the 18th and most of the 19th century uh, in terms of the kind of authoritarian government, uh, it might have suited Russia, but now Russia is in a process of transformation, beginning of significant transformation, uh, industrialization, and so on. And of course, the empire is changing, but 
Tsar and his attitude toward uh, his own uh, rule is are not. And then what happened in 1904 and 5, internal revolution and failure in the Russo-Japanese War, uh, forces the birth of what I call a semi-constitutional government, because it's not a fully constitutional government, in the sense that, yes, there, uh, there are fundamental laws of the land and so on, but uh, really some of the primary elements of, uh, of the autocracy are retained, and the most important ones uh, are that the Tsar had uh, complete charge over the military and the conduct of foreign affairs. And in addition to that, uh, this is when you have the Duma, the appearance of the Duma, the, the lower house of the, of the bicameral legislature, uh, had certainly the power of the purse, but only in a limited way. So uh, by limited way, I mean, uh, if uh, the Duma did not agree with the budget put forward by the emperor, then the budget from last year automatically took effect. So, so you're protected, uh, and he's protected. Uh, main, main problem is, is that, uh, in addition to the, uh, that commentary, is the fact that um, his prime ministers could never convince him of the necessity for creating a unified government. And that is uh, a cabinet that was answerable only to the prime minister, and then the prime minister in turn is answerable to the Tsar. So what you have is a situation in which uh, the war minister, uh, the, the, the naval minister, uh, and other ministers simply report to the Tsar independently outside of the prime minister. The prime minister does not always know what's going on, does not always know what the foreign minister is doing in terms of... Uh, and so what the, the system enables the Tsar to divide, and as one of my friends, uh, David Wolf in Japan says, to divide and misrule. <laughs> But here, your own <coughs> master, uh, uh, you, you can't, unfortunately, you can't see it, but over here is the, the, the census form, the first page of the census form for 1897, in which uh, uh, Nicholas lists, lists himself as Kozyayan Uskwezimun. Now, uh, with all of the, the, the uh, noise going on in the background, uh, revolutionary movements, uh, strikes and so on, uh, rapid change, in, at least in some areas, uh, Nicholas tends to take refuge uh, in this rule, family, and army. And the last bullet there, the realization that it's only the guards and some uh, units in the army that saved him from uh, going under in the revolution of 1905. Uh, because what happened, uh, and there's a contrast here between uh, the war of 1904 and 5 and the war of 1914 and 17 <coughs> for the Russians. And that is in 1904 and 5, no guards units went to the Far East to fight that war. And in fact, uh, only a handful of officers, a few dozen, uh, they all stayed right there in, in St. Petersburg. Uh, and so when uh, the revolution broke out in St. Petersburg, uh, you have a force of uh, 20 to 30,000 uh, troops that can automatically augment uh, the 10,000 or so police. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the workers' segment of the population was still relatively small. I think about 100,000 in 1905, whereas in 1917 it was about four or five times that. Uh, and uh, the guards, the main units of the guards' regiments were all at the front in 1917. So in part, that explains why uh, the Tsar was not saved in 1917 by the guards and the army. And in fact, uh, one of the arguments that I make as I'm working on the manuscript uh, uh, on uh, the Russian army in World War I is that 
uh, as with the regimental commander's mentality, which I basically think uh, characterized the emperor, uh, it, it's, it's a nice compact world in which you can engage with minutiae and you don't have to really put together pieces of the big picture. And I love that. He used to read every day. The only paper he religiously read was Ruski in Berlin, which is the daily of the, of the Russian army. And he said that other papers got on his nerves. And of course, he's like the perfect regimental commander. Uh, uh, nice looking, sits a good mount, rides well in parade, or on parade. And yeah, there's a considerable amount of naval sentiment I've gone back and forth with uh, one of my colleagues in Russia about this. But, but in, in the end, uh, the emperor considered himself the first soldier of the empire. There, the naval sentiment on the left, dressed up as a navy officer. And of course, his devotion to the guards there on the left in the crew of Brzezinski and over here in the, in the lifeguard hussar. The lifeguard hussar regiment was like the regiment of all regiments. Uh, if you wanted to be the cat's meow and you were a young nobleman in St. Petersburg, you wanted to be a lifeguard hussar. That was where all the action was. And of course, it was stupendously expensive to be an officer in that regiment and uh, uh, so you had to be among society's anointed to even have pretensions uh, to belong to that regiment. But then the other side of it is too and you have to think about uh, one of the contrasts I think about is uh, uh, the German Emperor and the Austro-Hungarian Emperor uh, if you look at them in comparison, uh, they really don't have these attributes that Nicholas has. Uh, <coughs> he was de facto commander-in-chief, well they, they were too, de facto commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy, but uh, by virtue of his relationship to the ministers in the cabinet, he receives all the bi-weekly briefings, he knows exactly what the status of his armed forces are. Uh, he reads, he looks at all of the important materials regarding war plans and mobilization schedules. And if you were going to tell me that Franz Joseph, you know, in Vienna, I, I'm, I, he probably wouldn't even know what a mobilization schedule looked like. Um, and then he would attend, observe, and look at the critiques of significant war games and exercises, and he'd get periodic updates. So this is a guy that really should be right in with the military. And, and what happens is this gets translated, skipping over a lot of, of, of uh, detail, to his assumption of supreme command in the field in 1915. Uh, uh, you'll probably recall that uh, his cousin, uh, Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich, uh, was the first supreme commander in the field. Uh, the Tsar, uh, Nicholas, wanted to go to the field to be supreme commander himself, and his cabinet talked him out of it in 1914. They said, you need to stay here in St. They're in Petrograd by then, uh, as they renamed it. Uh, you need to stay here to coordinate all the affairs of central government. Uh, and then there's more to it than that. Uh, it's like that there's an impulse among certain Tsars. Uh, Peter the Great was an exception. He actually did command in the field, although usually he let Sheremetyev or uh, Menshikov command. And at Narva in 1709, uh, Peter the Great was a battalion commander in the Preobrazhensky regiment. Uh, so, so usually he let his other, his uh, senior officers command for him, and he took his place in the ranks. Alexander I, during the Napoleonic campaigns, wanted to take personal command in the field. Alexander II, during the Russo-Turkish War in 77 and 78, wanted to take personal command in the field. And his advisors would say, you have to remember, who you are is the emperor. 
that you carry so much prestige that if you get defeated in the field, that is a significant blow to the prestige of the monarchy. So you always let somebody else take the rap. Well, the situation got bad enough in 1915, um, and, and really on the, well, it's not on the heels, it's actually toward the end of the so-called Great Retreat when uh, the Germans turn east. They figure out they can't crack the nut in, on the western front, so they turn east with, in full fury. Uh, and they figure they'll knock Russia out of the war. And in the process, they reconquer all of uh, Austrian Galicia, uh, throw the Russians out of uh, most of Russian Poland, uh, and uh, make significant inroads into uh, the Baltic provinces. And finally are stopped along a, a river swamp line uh, um, oh, I'd have to stop and think, which now lies, uh, what, eastern Poland, western Belarus, western uh, Ukraine. Uh, and uh, so they're stopped, and the, the emperor felt in order to inspire his troops that he had to go to the front. And they're, 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 that's a very complex... Uh, uh, calculus that's behind that, but uh, you know, for 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 now, I'll leave it with that with that last bullet. Get out of the pick capital. Get away from all of the intrigue, uh, all of the backbiting, uh, and go to direct supervision of the military. And so you see him at the front. Uh, uh, here is before he assumes high command with uh, his cousin Nikolai Nikolaevich. Here he is with headquarters of the Supreme Command. Uh, here he is with uh, General Alexeyev, his chief of staff, and his operations officer, Pusto Wojtienko. And there he is wearing the cross of uh, St. George Fourth Class, which is uh, uh, the highest decoration for heroism in Russian, the Imperial Russian Army. And uh, there's a long story behind that. I mean, uh, yeah, they cribbed it for him. Uh, he and his son were somewhere within the range of German artillery fire on one of their visits to the front. No shells fell close to them, but, but uh, the uh, officers uh, in command, or the, the officers in charge of awarding uh, the George Cross held a meeting of the assembly for voting on the George Cross, and they, they voted to give the George Cross to Tsarevich Alexei, who was with his father. And then a week later, they said, you know, not a good idea to give it to the son when the father was right alongside him, so they give it to him, too. So he very proudly wears that cross of St. George Fourth Class. And there are some positive aspects to this. Remember, you're getting back to that characteristic, that, that sense of serenity and calmness. You know, under, under Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich, headquarters in the field is like, uh, you know, a circus. Uh, and characterized by one military historian as a kind of anarchy, strategic anarchy. Uh, and when the emperor comes in, and this is partly the emperor and it's partly Alexeyev, they're both the same about this. Uh, they're both very self-contained and very orderly and very serene in the way they present themselves. And in fact, there's a lot of argument over this now. Uh, what you'll see, uh, I gave something, I gave this presentation in Russian before the Academy of Sciences last spring, and I got attacked by a monarchist <laughs> who said, how dare you, you know, impute these characteristics to the emperor and so on. And he was a great commander, and, and especially General Alexeyev is the one who's basically calling the tune on all specialized, you know, all specialized operational topics. But, what they do is they get a stabilized front and things sufficiently clued together so that uh, they can undertake semi-successful offensive operations in 1916. And there he is, I'm at the front. The, the drawing in the middle is the Tsarevich uh, <laughs> doing a, a drawing of the old man. And then, you know, there they, there they are. 
And it, you know, it is really difficult to assess this, is what is the impact of these visits to the front? Do, are the troops really inspired? It's hard to tell. Uh, it reminds me of scenes from the Russian Civil War, you know, in which a, a Russian village you know, in the middle of nowhere would be minding its own business, and the whites would ride into, cro into town, into the village, and everybody, hurrah, hurrah, and run up, you know, the, the white banners and so on, and when the whites left, the banners come down, the village go back to normal, and the reds ride on top, hurrah, you know, <laughs> you just don't know uh, uh, how, how that affected the troops. One thing, and I don't know, I've gone back and forth with our colleague Jay Kipp a little bit about this, is there's one scene particularly in 1915 where the emperor, one of his functions of these visits to the front is to hand out military awards, military decorations, especially to George Cross. And so soldiers are all lined up, and, and like everything else, they're all told how to conduct themselves in front of the emperor. And under no circumstances, after, when the emperor pins that cross on or sticks it on, however they did it, are you to shake hands with the emperor? And of course, this one clawed machine gunner forgets his instructions and takes the emperor's hand and shakes it. You know, and of course, what does Nicholas do? Wipes his hand. <laughs> and you know, you do that. I, I, you know, and Jake and I have gone back and forth about that. He says, you know, you have to understand that mentality. I said, Jake. These guys are dying for you, and, and you you have to wash your hands after you uh, shake their hand. You know, I mean, uh, it really doesn't leave a very good impression. George W. Bush did that <laughs> in Haiti. I, yeah, I've forgotten about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I, I think he wiped his hands on someone's shirt. Was it was it the other president or? <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. We, <laughs> no, anyway, <laughs> and here he is. He's also joined by the Empress at times at the front. The family is down to visit. Uh, the Tsarevich will uh, live for certain amounts of time with the Emperor at, at headquarters. And the Empress, along with uh, the daughters, will come and visit in one of the Imperial trains uh, uh, for a time, too. Um, and uh, so this is very important in terms of the things that Lori Stoff, you know, one of our one of our uh, uh, KU folks, when she writes about the Russian Sisters of Mercy and so on, a uh, very important aspect of, of uh, the non-strictly military side of the war. Um, and but if you look at what happens in the aggregate with Nicholas is that his residence at uh, headquarters at uh, not quite close to the front, but close enough to the front, it leaves a vacuum. And of course, what happens is this vacuum is filled by the Empress. And meanwhile, at, while he's at headquarters, Nicholas can uh, intervene in higher command appointments that he should, should have well left to Alexeyev, because it gets him in trouble. Alexeyev, I'll give you one example. Alexeyev truly hated Kuropotkin for the defeats in 1904 and 5. Kuropotkin was the commander in the Far East. And yet somehow, he, Kuropotkin invigled, invigled the Tsar to give him an appointment first as a corps commander, then an army commander, and then a front commander in 1916. And you can, if you, I mean, if you ever read the letters to his wife from 1945, how much he hated Kuropotkin, uh, you could see that the blood would probably be boiling right below the surface, but he can't say anything. Uh, and finally, he's able to get rid of him. But uh, there's one of those, uh, Bieza Brazov, the commander of the, of the, of the, uh, the Guards Corps, uh, another appointment. The guy has got Teflon, no matter what happens to him, uh, he's always protected because he's the commander of the Guards Corps. Um, and uh, this happens enough times so that you raise an eyebrow over it. And then what, uh, what they do is the guards units are aggregated into two corps, first and second guards corps, and then they become the nucleus for what is called the special army. 
uh, with the addition of one more corps, I think 23rd, I've forgotten the number of the other one. Uh, and the Special Army is a strategic reserve, reserve that can re be released and employed only with the consent of the Emperor. And of course, during the last part of the Brusilov Offensive in 1916, uh, they committed the guards to uh, an offensive, uh, a continuation of the offensive on the Stokod River, not far from uh, uh, the southern part of the Pripet Marshes, and uh, they were slaughtered. Uh, they were slaughtered so badly they had to be pulled out of the line and reorganized and regrouped. And of course, uh, they're a long way from Petrograd. This is already September, October 1916. Uh, so they're not going to be around when troubles break out in Petrograd. And here, in my view, and I'm going back and forth with this now with the with the Russian specialists and so on. That, in my view, there's a major turning point that occurs in June 1916. And, and it, it's, it's a, with a proposal of General Alexeyev. Uh, and what he wants to do is he wants to create an all-powerful Ministry of State Defense. And essentially, uh, I would argue, uh, this is essentially what Stalin did in July 1941 to coordinate all rear support activities that relate to uh, your ability to uh, have a, a uh, viable fighting front. Um, and here you'll see, actually, this is pretty much almost the model, probably, in, in a sense that Stalin will follow, uh, probably not consciously, probably unknowingly, although it's not for certain either. And the emperor takes a look at this. And again, you're back to that one big idea. If I create this all-powerful Minister of State Defense, you know, how will that relate to me as autocrat? You know, it's, in, the sense, in essence, he's creating a, a domestic dictator. And he doesn't buy it, but then again, here is, here is the emperor. Rather than saying no to Alexeyev to his face, which he never does, he says, oh, I'll give this proposal to my cabinet of ministers to decide. And of course, the cabinet ministers look at why do we want to lose any power? No. And not only that, but all of the, uh, the civil, there are civilian organizations which are involved in the war effort. Prince Lvov is uh, head of the Zemstvo movement, and uh, uh, oh, there, I'm trying to think, um, Radzianko, the, the, uh, the chairman of the Duma. Uh, and all, they, they, you figure that they'd buy into this to get a more effective war, but they don't want to have their, their kind of power diluted either, so they come out against it, so the thing utterly fails. And in my, in my view, this is probably the last time when they had any real opportunity of imposing any kind of order on the war effort. They lost it. Can I ask a question? Sure. Right? Who would he have picked for a position like that? That's the question. When that's a good question because again I go back and forth uh, with, uh, with both with my U.S. and my Russian colleagues, and they say there's no there's no option. And I said no, the answer is not Alexeyev. He's got his hands full and he's half sick. But I said who's the guy who becomes commander of the special army when Bezobrazov fails? Gurko. Gurko. Yeah, who has the confidence of the Tsar, enough confidence so he makes him commander of the special army. Uh, and he's got a name, Gurko is the hero, his father is the hero of 77 and 78 and so on, uh, big name, but not, uh, not somebody from the royal family who's a threat to the Tsar himself, a political threat like Nikolai Nikolaevich would be, any of the Grand Dukes. Another candidate is, uh, is uh, Sergei Mikhailovich, uh, one of the Grand Dukes who's running the artillery administration, but he's somewhat sick. But he could have headed it up and let Manikovsky, the general who was actually running things in the, uh, in the artillery department, do all the work. Uh, and then I had somebody else I was thinking of too, but those are two major candidates that could have done, that could have done the job. 
Uh, and then the irony is, if you look at the Tsar's correspondence, you know, corresponding with his wife in September of 1916, and he says, he writes, you know, Alexeyev was right. He said, I should have, you know, and what he does is he turns plenipotentiary power over to the chairman of the Council of Ministers, uh, Sturmer, who's an idiot. And so nothing gets done. Everything stays just the way it was. But Nicholas in September says, I should have, should have followed Alexeyev's advice, but you know it would have created more problems with the military, and I didn't know how to handle it. So here's what happens, the unpleasant consequences. The administration drifts. And there's, again, there's a whole legend, uh, or semi-legend, that goes about now in Russia that, that if, if the February Revolution of 1917 hadn't occurred, uh, the army was ready uh, and willing to undertake solid offensive operations in the spring of 1917. And I look at that army, you know, and the, and the Russians, here I don't get much grief from the Russians. I say, you know, in 1914, there are three or four different Russian armies during the war. The first one is the Kadri army that goes to war in uh, July, August 1914. They're probably as good, uh, especially at division level and low, as any European army. By the time the officer corps has been half wiped out, uh, in the fall uh, and winter of 1914-15, and then the great retreat in 1915, most of the, of the company grade officers are, are gone. And so now they're calling up reserve, or not calling up, they're, they're promoting reservists. And these are pretty good reservists. They're school teachers and so on. They become junior officers. They get wiped out in the offense of 1916. And so what you're left with <laughs> is uh, butcher, candlestick maker, and so on. Uh, anybody who is semi, even semi-literate. It's uh, one of the authors I was reading was saying, virtually anybody who was in the army who uh, was semi-literate by 1917 had a commission as an officer. And so what that means for the army, when you look at the leadership and you look at the peasant core of the army, which is not being trained the way the cadre army was trained in you know, I mean, before 1914, you know, they're getting a week, maybe two weeks, and then they're being sent to the front. Uh, and you get these guys led by officers who have no respect, who enjoy no respect among the rank and file. And so, if in, in 1914 you had a solid cadre army, by the end of 1915 and 1916 you've got a militia army. By 1917 you've got an armed mob. Mom. You go from cadre army to militia army to armed mob. And so, When you get this occurring, and then you get the, the rear area army garrisons, which become disaffected because nobody wants to get sent to the front. Uh, and the army high command is alienated from the Tsar because he's not doing the things he needs to do for them to pursue the war. So they become neutral to indifferent to the dynasty. And that becomes very dangerous then. If you look at the oath that every officer takes, or every actually officer and enlisted man takes, and conscript takes, uh, if you look at that oath, the Tsar and his land are considered indivisible. Now they've become divisible. And the officer corps itself is divided. And the rank and file by now, they're so sick of the war that they're indifferent to hostile. And when these anti-government disorders sweep the urban centers, looks like the liberal constitutionalists have the, the, the idea with the limited monarchy. And the army that had saved the Tsar in 1905 now stands apart from its commander. And here are the various events and so on. And here's what happens in the end. And this is, this is actually the wonderful one. Here, here's for 
you know, I, I use this on my monarchist friend in, in Moscow. It wasn't the uh, wasn't the, the officer corps that walked away from the Tsar, it was the Tsar who walked away from the army. Because he didn't do the things that the Tsar should have done. Oh, there they are in exile and so on. Okay. Uh, we have what, ten minutes or so for Q and A? Fourteen, actually. Oh, oh that's right, I forgot. Yeah. That clock's always ten minutes, <laughs> five minutes left. Yeah, yeah. So it's, again, it's a very complicated uh, kind of thing. Nobody, you know, as a, obvious as it seems, nobody's actually done any work on the Tsar as Supreme Commander. Why do you think that is? Uh, well, because nobody in the Soviet period cared, or at least officially cared. Uh, and then they're now just getting around to it. I'm now just starting to see dissertations and so on that include that as a major topic. You would think that the Soviet Union, the Soviet uh, Academy would not object to someone maligning the Tsar? Well, but it was, it was uh, working on the Tsarist family and so on was so far away from the kind of yeah. reality that they, they just don't want to stop. bring them yeah, forward. They, oh, no, they, they just didn't want to well. Since, uh, thank you for a great presentation, uh, Bruce. Uh, since you brought up, you know, the current monarchists or at least people who hold the uh, uh, imperial family as in great reverence, they are of course canonized as saints mm -hmm. in the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, do you see that as a significant obstacle in the current Russian uh, political climate for serious research being undertaken? Because if you're studying somebody who is you know, a canonized saint in state, by all means, if it's not officially state, church, uh, dissenting views may uh, receive less than favorable reception. I don't see it so much of an obstacle as I see it uh, as, and maybe almost an unconscious invitation to, to self-censor or to shape one's views mm -hmm. in a way that would seem more favorable to the imperial, to uh, mm -hmm. the emperor. That, that's where I would see the problem. Yeah. But no, I, uh, because, because by and large you could sit down to a group of Russian historians and, and, uh, and it's like I, I say to my Russian colleagues, I said, you know, it's up to the Russian Orthodox Church if they want to declare, you know, the emperor a saint, that's fine. I said on the grounds of his martyrdom and so on, certainly that merits possibly sainthood. I said, uh, the way that he ran the uh, the empire does not. But I mean, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a distinction, by the way, that a lot of people don't make. They're not really sainted. You know, they're not like... St. Peter, <laughs> they are martyrs for the, yeah, they died for the. Yeah, it's our martyr, it's our yeah. Yeah. And then the question is, is if they made the emperor a, 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 a saint, what about Alexei? Well, they're not actually saints. There's a different term that's used Whoops, in Russian. Whoops, I, I will yeah. be now here, okay. You, you, you might want to look at the term that's used. I, okay, yeah. I have so to So Novo the new martyrs. The new yeah. 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 yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, it's generally, I mean, people translate that very freely. But yeah, I was just going to say, it, but the, it's the, not a the title saint. It's not a canonization like for a, like the Catholic Church. Mm. Well, no, no, no. I mean, it's, it, it's, a, categ it's a category mm -hmm. okay. of beatification, but not canonization. Okay, yet. okay. Well, then, I, you know, I'd buy that if, if you're talking about level of beatification. However, yeah. you know, the, in terms of uh, veneration, you know, in churches, oh, in terms sure. of icons and things of that kind, I mean, uh, this is a very intense I mean, phenomenon, and uh, therefore, uh, ha you know, the, the argument about self-censorship that you brought, because mm -hmm. it would, uh, uh, for, to some people, appear, you know, a very transgressive gesture 
you know, to do the uh, uh, criticism in lieu of that the kind of veneration that mm -hmm. happened. I mean, I'm not I'm not in, endorsing those views. I'm just saying that this is a problem uh, that you know we need to address when interacting with people who. Uh, try to approach this within Russian society. You may find that they will avoid the topic. That's the kind of a self-censorship. Mm -hmm. Or uh, you may find, you, what, you, what you have to do is, you, if somebody's working on a research topic or if they have publications, what you want to do is you want to look and see who underwrote those. Because, I mean, there's some people who work for, like, uh, uh, universities or university-like organizations that are under the tutelage of the Orthodox Church, well then, okay, that comes close to uh, having a kind of an influence over somebody. So those are the things that you would, you would look for. Uh, and, you know, they may, may be perfectly straight up, I don't know, it just would depend. You'd have to look at the scholarship because there are all kinds of all kinds of issues that go back and forth. You know, uh, one of them is uh, uh, Alexeyev during all of immigration, all of the immigration periods and so on, has always been considered a traitor. Uh, the man who, be, who betrayed his oath. And yet, if you look at the, the train of telegrams and everything else that are going back and forth between Petrograd, uh, Skov, where the emperor was on the siding, uh, and Stavka, which you'll see is that, by and large, uh, the uh, Alexeyev remains loyal up almost right up to the end. He will not, and even even in the language he uses in the telegram, when he when he telegraphs the emperor, he says. Given these considerations, you will know, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, you will know what is the proper decision to make. In other words, he does not say, okay, it's time, but you will know the proper decision. So it, it's indirect, even indirect up to that point. Uh, and uh, I must say, in terms of the preparations they had made to, to, to suppress disturbances and so on, Alexeyev followed all those preparations right to the letter of, of, of uh, the plans and so on. It was the emperor himself who intervened and changed the plans and changed them in a way that made them almost invalid as means of suppressing disturbances. He always went with that idea. He had this thing about uh, the people I know directly those are the people I trust. And so Alexeyev had a recipe, not a recipe, he had a list of loyal regiments that you'd call on uh, because they were closest to railway stations. Uh, they had good commanders and they would be the ones that would be sent to Petrograd to suppress disturbances. And the emperor does not like them because he does not know the commanders. So what he does is he gives them a different list that has units that are out in left field, so it's harder to get them to train station or to embar embarkation points and so on and so forth. He spoils his own plans or the or the uh, Stavka's own plans for suppressing an uprising. Mm -hmm. And probably uh, insults the commanders of those <coughs> units. Of those well, the, well, maybe, but I mean, uh, uh, but uh, and, then, and then and then and then again, this 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 indecisiveness when he sends. Uh, uh, General Ivanov, along with uh, what he did was uh, to suppress the, the disturbances in Petrograd, uh, he sent a train full of what are called the George Cavaliers. There was a, uh, an honor guard consisting of uh, six to eight hundred soldiers who had earned the George Cross. They were the honor guard at headquarters for the Tsar. And they were put on a train under the commander of a plenipotentiary, General Ivanov. Uh, to restore order. And by the time he arrived at Tsarskoye Silo, where the royal family was, uh, the Tsar no longer actually instructed him not to use force. And then uh, the, the George Cavaliers, the commanders themselves, one, <coughs> one, of, the, one of the commanders, uh, a colonel, just says, I will not order my troops to fire on Russian people. So they were also, you know, things were coming apart very rapidly all over the place. So 
<coughs> I, I don't believe that anything short of the most for, a ferocious uh, military campaign, uh, probably employing about two divisions of troops with with artillery and being able to control the railways and so on, would have been able to suppress what was going on in Petrograd. And there would have been a lot of there would have been a lot of bloodletting. It would have made 1905, you know, look like a, a Sunday school picnic. Bruce, mm -hmm. as you were talking. It seemed to me that one of the differences with Nicholas is he didn't have a good Grand Duke like Grand Duke Constantine under Alexander II or a civil servant like Gorchakov to really pull him out. Well, he at some point he did, you could argue. I mean, uh, I don't know how to take Vita. Vita is so much of a an egotist and uh, wanting things his way and so on. But every time he had somebody like that, Vita, you know, he got rid of. Stilipin was assassinated. Uh, Kokovsov was not of that level of, of, of uh, yeah. person. And <coughs> Gorchakov had both sides, foreign and domestic. I mean, um, um, Sazonov, no. I mean, he's, a, he's, a, he's basically a functionary. Yeah. So yeah, he does not have that. But I don't know. I would call into question whether or not his mentality would accept that kind of counsel. Maybe from a grand duke. But see, there's the problem because automatically, uh, it's like uh, um, in 1905 to quell the revolutionary wave. The idea was was bandied about that they should make Nicholas Nikolaevich a military dictator. And supposedly, and I think it's probably pretty good evidence there to suggest that, that when the idea was broached to him, he said to the Tsar, he said, if you make me a military dictator, I'm going to shoot myself. So that was, uh, so he doesn't, he's the most influential military person in the imperial family, and yet he himself is not always the most stable person. Uh, so you're not getting good advice from him. Yeah. I'm interested in the, uh, this idea of uh, master of the Russian land that you said that he was. What, you, was it the 1897 census? 1897, first, yeah. first all Russian census. Oh, okay, great. Is, is there, so it was not the people? He was a master of the Russian land? Well, it, would, it, would, it, it involved it, anything that was on it, too. So, right. yeah, the people but, and its but What was the Russian? You said Hus I think I have to get to the native speakers. Okay. Yeah. More formal. Yeah. I'd have to go back and, and enlarge that to see. Oh, and by the way, uh, by the way, the, the double irony of that, given the title of that motion picture, uh, Master and Commander, is that in the end, and I hadn't thought about this until after I was in Yekaterinburg, that in the end, his perspective was about as great as the perspective of, of, of a frigate commander in the 18th century. That which you could see and command right at hand, and your horizons are what you can see. So the irony, it, it really worked. <laughs> that title really works in an ironic kind of way. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you for your attention.